is your fourth day of your internship. It is noon time and you're ready to go grab lunch. However, your senior calls you up and gives you an admission. A 70 year old male with a past medical history of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease status post 2 stents was brought in by EMS after being found by the doctor to have a slurred speech and drooping of his face upon waking up. The patient was last seen to be normal at 9 pm the night before. The patient is brought to the ED, stroke code is called and the patient is being given to you. Current time is 12 p.m. in the afternoon. All right, guys. So based on the case that's presented to you, what do you think is going on with this patient? Patient's got slurred speech as well as a facial droop. And this tells you the patient most likely is having a stroke. All right. So the diagnosis is pretty straightforward. However, as I said before, what is the most important thing when it comes to stroke? It is time. So now the question is, when was the patient last seen to be normal? This was seen to be normal at 9 p.m. the night before. And right now, the time is 12 p.m. in the afternoon it's almost been about 15 hours since the patient was last seen to be normal so the real question is is this patient a candidate for TPA at this point or not clearly you guys have already learned from the previous episode where the patient has to be within three hours or 4.5 hours to get any form of TPA is the patient a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy maybe even uh, up to 24 hours you could still do mechanical thrombectomy but then we have to uh, invest Investigate further to see if he's a candidate or not. However, important thing is this patient is not a candidate for TPA. So let's move on into the physical examination. On physical examination, let's look at the patient's vital signs. So vital signs are blood pressure of 200 over 110, heart rate is 80, respiratory rate is 16, and a temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit. On general examination, you see that the patient when he's talking, he's got this slurred speech, all right? And apart from that, you also see that he clearly has a left-sided facial paralysis. All right, let's move on to the neurologic examination because that is going to be the key component of your physical exam at this point. All right, <clears throat> on neurologic examination, again, you're seeing a left-sided complete facial nerve paralysis, which is affecting above the eyebrows as well as below the eyebrows. And apart from that, you see the patient's also got a right-sided upper limb as well as lower limb loss of muscle power basically having muscle weakness however the patient's got an increased tone and increased reflexes now what this really signifies is that the patient is having an upper motor neuron lesion we'll be going in depth into exactly what this is about in my uh, uh, topic which is going to be on localizing stroke lesions for now let's move on in the clinical aspect of things so cardiovascular examination is normal s1 s2 heard no robs gallops or murmurs respiratory system normal vesicular breath sounds are heard there is no wheezes crackles or anything us lower extremity there is no swelling there's no evidence of any form of dvt or pitting pedal edema all right guys so you have completed a very thorough history and a physical examination now let's move on to the labs and orders so this patient is coming with a neurologic deficit so you clearly know that this patient most likely is having a stroke so what are the three important tests that you must order right now all right so number one you guys already know is ct head without contrast an MRI head all right you can do either one of them whichever one is faster CT head or a MRI head the reason we would do a CT head is because you want to rule out the fact that there might be any form of blood in the brain you know the CAT scan does not pick up an ischemic stroke as early as an MRI but your goal is not to identify is there a stroke or not it's rather to rule out the presence of a bleed because management differs completely all right so fine you're gonna do a CT head and an MRI Right. either one of them is fine number two what you're gonna do is finger stick as I said before finger stick must be done uh, POCT glucose and number three is gonna be your oxygen saturation in a simple test such as a pulse oximetry the reason you do these two tests with anybody who's coming with a suspected stroke is because hypoglycemia and hypoxia could present like a stroke so you want to make sure these two factors are not present uh, and that's not the reason that the patient is having these symptoms all right you're done placing your three most important initial orders so let's move on to the rest of the orders that you must place in this case as an intern all right so your basic labs you're going to order is your cbc all right you're going to order a cmp complete metabolic 
panel. You also going to get a lipid panel on this patient. You also want to get a PTT, PT, and an INR. And uh, you also want to get an EKG because you want to see if there's any rhythms that's present that's going to predispose this patient to actually having a stroke, such as atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. So that's important. For that reason, you must get an EKG. Just x-ray, again, it's not always important, but you're suspecting uh, some form of respiratory uh, pathology, you can always get a chest x-ray as well. All right. Now, the other very important test, which is very unique to cases of stroke, is these tests, which is on your right-hand side. So you have to get a CTA head and neck. Now, the thing is, it's a CT angiography of your head and neck. Essentially, what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at the blood vessels that are supplying your brain. Now remember when you do a CT angiography you do give contrast so when you give contrast remember there is a chance of contrast induced nephropathy so if somebody's got a renal dysfunction this test this test is not really going to be your ideal choice so is there an alternative that you could do yes there is it is going to be MRA it's a magnetic resonance angiography the good thing is here you do not use contrast all right but the same test MRA head and neck so essentially again trying to see the blood vessels of your your head and neck basically supplying your brain so if you have a patient who has some form of processes or has a pacemaker and therefore cannot get an MRI uh, or MRA head and neck in this patient what you could do is a CT angio so the question is really you have either one of the choice you have to choose based on your patient if renal dysfunction go with your MRA if the patient has some form of metal in the body and you cannot do an MRA go for the CT angio so the choice is really yours okay all right next you're also going to get an echo with bubble study echo with bubble essentially tells you if there is a shunting from your right atrium to the left atrium because think about it guys if you had a dvt on your leg trace the vasculature you're going to go eventually into your ivc which is going to come into what into your right atrium from right atrium ideally you should go to right ventricle through the pulmonary artery and cause a pulmonary embolism never should it cause a stroke however if you have a small opening in your septum of the atria between your right and the left atria now this clot can get shunted into the left atrium and now to the left ventricle boom you're gonna go and have a stroke so the presence when you do an echo with bubble study essentially tells you if the patient has a patent foramen ovel or an ASD all right so that's the reason you must do an echo with bubble study all right Next, you're also going to do a carotid duplex. Now, the thing is, if you're doing a CT angio of head and neck or an MRA of head and neck, then you do not have to do carotid duplex. Back in the day, we used to always do carotid duplex, but now we don't do it much because we do mostly CTA or MRA. Okay, the next test is going to be a 24-hour Holter monitor. Now, 24-hour Holter monitor does not have to be done in everybody. If your EKG already shows that the patient has a baseline atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, then you don't have to do a Holter monitor. But if there is no abnormal rhythm seen on EKG, it'll be a great idea for you to get a Holter monitor because you could still have a paroxysm atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter all right this completes your orders that you're going to place as an intern this brings us to our final section which is going to be on the most important thing which is assessment and plan because assessment and plan tells your senior resident as well as the attendings that you know what you're talking about so make sure you have a very good assessment and plan all right so based on this patient's history physical examination all the lab tests we've done and, and the CAT scan showed yes the patient does have an ischemic stroke or the MRI that you did shows that the patient has an ischemic stroke fine now what are you going to do for treatment of this patient question is this as i always said what is the number one factor that you must consider in a patient with stroke it is time this patient presented after 15 hours the sad part about this is the patient is clearly outside the therapeutic window for tpa so this is out you do not have tpa for this patient it is out all right now this patient say you did a cta or an mra and you do not find that the patient has any form of large vessel occlusion and therefore the patient is not a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy either all right now this leaves us to the question all right what are you gonna do so now i'm gonna put this in two scenarios for you say for instance this patient was not on any form of home aspirin in that patient what you're gonna do is you're gonna start the patient on aspirin right now 
Now, if I make the scenario a little different, because our patient, remember, he had a stent placement, right? Uh, and most people who have a stent placement will be on aspirin indefinitely. So if this patient was on aspirin at home. Now, what are you going to do? Because he developed a stroke while being on aspirin. So you need to change this. You have two choices. What you could do if the patient was on aspirin, you can either go and switch this into clopidogrel. All right. Or what you could do is you would do aspirin plus dipyridamol. All right. Aspirin plus dipyridamol. Dipyridamol is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor and eventually prevents the aggregation of platelets. So you have two options. Your patient was on aspirin at home. You can either switch to clopidogrel or do aspirin plus dipyridamol. And the drug name is known as Agrinox. All right. It's called Agrinox. If you look at this treatment, what you're doing really is you're not treating the acute infarct that the patient developed. Unfortunately, the guy came in late. So that's the problem. However, you what you're going to do at this point in time is essentially prevent prevent the next stroke from happening. That's all you can offer. It's sad, but that's all you can offer. All right, guys, so let's move on to the rest of the assessment and plan, all right? So you started the patient on a antiplatelet agent. If the patient was not on aspirin, you're gonna start aspirin. If he was already on aspirin, you can either switch to uh, clopidogrel or do aspirin plus dipyridamol. So antiplatelet agent is covered. Number two, what you wanna do is you wanna start the patient on a high intensity statin. Now recall that the two high intensity statins that's out there is only atovastatin or rosuvastatin so again as i went on with my last video what you're going to do is you can do 80 milligrams of high intensity statin for four days and after four days you can bring it down to 40 milligrams at bedtime all right now again long-term therapy of statin usage is essentially going to be following the ascvd score which we will be covering in a different section altogether however for acute management you you must remember antiplatelet agent and high intensity statin all right you've done both these parts very good that doesn't solve the issue there's still a lot of parameters you must remember in any patient with a stroke so number one fluids all right, so as I said, if this patient is coming with a stroke, he's going to have a chance that he's probably going to have some component of dysphagia. Why do they have dysphagia? It's because of potentially they are going to be having some form of damage to 9th or 10th cranial nerve or neurologic dysfunction can lead to some component of dysphagia. So if you have a patient who's here with a stroke and you don't want to start him on a feeding, now your senior is going to ask you, okay, what fluid do you want to give this patient? And you're like, all right, the guy is not eating and... Uh, the patient sodium is also about say 155 so you're like you know what I don't want to give too much sodium in my fluid let me give some sugar maybe I'll do d5 half and s you think that's a great choice absolutely not you are gonna literally kill this patient if you chose a fluid like this now if it was a very minor stroke it's not gonna impact it so much however if it's a large uh, ischemic stroke affecting a very large area there's a large there's a very good chance that the patient can develop cerebral edema any form of hyper tonic solution you give is going to have a lot of free water the free water is going to go and swell up your brain this can cause cerebral edema what you have to remember is you will use nothing but normal saline you will only use isotonic solution in a patient with a stroke for the first 24 to 48 hours that you cannot change with any other fluid all right very good number two blood pressure management remember what the blood pressure of this patient was it was 200 over 110 Seems pretty high, doesn't it? What are you going to do? Are you going to give the patient blood pressure medications? If you guys are saying no, you are absolutely correct. All right. So remember, in a patient who's not received any form of intervention, your target is much, much higher. If it's severe hypertension, then you can address it. So your target when you're going to start addressing blood pressure is if the blood pressure crosses 220 over 120. Again, drug choices that you have are the ones which you want to use in the form of an IV drip. You have three options. You have a labetalol. All right, or you have nicardipine, and the new one right now we have is clevi. Depine. So these are your three options and remember you don't want to drop the blood pressure immediately to a very low amount okay. The maximum you can decrease within the first 24 hours is about 15 percent okay. Do not drop the blood pressure more than 15 percent. This is very very important. So a person who comes with a stroke who does not get any intervention your blood pressure threshold is 
220 over 120 if it does not cross it do not start blood pressure medications period when we come to head of bed there's two schools of thought one school of thought says if the patient is lying down completely flat his supine obviously gravity is going to cause more blood to go to the brain and this is going to cause increased perfusion of the infarcted area it makes sense however with this uh, supine position lying down flat uh, comes the risk that the patient can have a lot of risk of aspiration so there's some school of thought says you know what place the patient in 30 degrees uh, head of bed should be elevated at 30 degree angle and for all practical purpose honestly speaking you should go with your 30 degree because this works out to be better all right so head of bed you're going to maintain the patient at 30 degree angle because why you want to prevent the patient from having aspiration on top of everything else that's going on all right next is hypo and hyperthermia as you guys know fever is bad for the brain if the patient is having an infarcted area infarcted brain fever is not not good so if the patient develops a fever uh, even though he's come in here with just a stroke you must do a sepsis workup you want to make sure the patient is not having some form of infection you also must take a look at all the medication to see if something is causing say neuroleptic malignant syndrome maybe a serotonin syndrome maybe malignant hyperthermia you want to see if you always think broad and then you can restrict your uh, thought to a narrow thing but initially always think broad either way my point is hypo and hyperthermia are bad you want to make sure the patient is normothermic you could use Tylenol and make sure the patient is normothermic all right next number five hypoglycemia hyperglycemia as you guys already know the brain and the heart really depend on a lot of nutrition all right so what happens is hypoglycemia is bad but hyperglycemia is also bad so you want to make sure the patient's blood sugar lies somewhere between 140 to 180 this is a safe range for all practical purposes so remember you want to keep your eye on the sugars as well feeding are you going to start a patient who came in with stroke uh, and give this guy a nice piece of steak to eat now it wouldn't be a good idea so what you want to do is make sure you want to get an official speech and swallow evaluation to assess the patient swallowing if the guy can actually swallow fine you can go ahead and start feeding him if you cannot swallow then you got to wait if a guy is not going to eat for 24 hours not like he's going to die all right so make sure you prevent anything that's going to cause some form of aspiration it's very very important because it happens very frequently if you do not follow these recommendations finally let's move on to the last component of your assessment and plan which is in fact going to be your dvt prophylaxis unlike a patient who's received tp or a mechanical thrombectomy these patients you should actually start them on chemical DVD prophylaxis at the time of diagnosis of an ischemic event all right so these patients you can actually do uh, Lovenox or you could do heparin the dosages is normally going to be Lovenox about 40 milligrams per day is good or heparin you can do 5000 uh, either BID or TID the choice is yours and along with it you can also put the patient on sequential compression devices basically a venodyne boots all right so DVD prophylaxis becomes a very important subject in a patient with stroke because clearly they are not moving much and therefore they're going to be at increased risk of developing another pulmonary embolism or maybe another stroke all right because if they develop a DVT so for that reason you must put them on DVD prophylaxis if you recall the previous section when we spoke about a patient who received TPA you say for the first 24 hours do not use any form of chemical DVD prophylaxis that doesn't exist here because you did not do any intervention therefore you can clearly start the patient on Lovenox, heparin or sequential compression devices all right guys so this concludes our assessment and plan however you have ordered a few tests that you must follow through with you did an echo with bubble study when you do an echo with bubble study and say you find out that the patient has a PFO a small hole between the patient's atrial septum now back in the day we used to always say you never close a PFO there's been multiple studies recently which is favoring the closure of a PFO however it's a controversial subject when you put in a device into the atrial septum increases the patient at risk for some form of abnormal atrial rhythm such as atrial fibrillation so the side effect of putting this uh, device is in fact atrial fibrillation 
but for now i'm not going to go into this subject you can uh, depending on which hospital you're working they could make the decision if they want to close the pfo or not but the recent studies basically is suggesting closure of pfo especially if it's a recurrent cryptogenic stroke which means a younger person who's got zero risk factors but is coming with multiple strokes for those patients there is some benefit of closure of pfo but again it is not part of guidelines yet the next test that you ordered was a holter monitor a 24 hour holter monitor now if you follow that and if you see the patient's got paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter at that point you will follow the chadwa score and decide if you're going to give this person anticoagulation or is antiplatelet just fine by itself so this concludes our section on management of acute ischemic stroke who is outside the therapeutic window i hope you guys enjoyed this video please subscribe and leave any comments below and i'll see you guys on the next video which is going to be on tia which is transient ischemic attack thank you